You're welcome. All right. So let's get into that part again for everybody can get clarity. I know the more that I say, the more clear it becomes. 1099 OID, basic explanation of how it is done. Basically, the state did not provide you with a check to pay the charges against you. Of course, when you're in court, they specifically ask the question, do you understand the charges being brought up against you? And just like a credit card has charges, you run up those charges. So now you have bad credit. Well, how do I discharge the charges? Well, in the credit case, you'd use a 1099-C. <laughs> So they are withholding taxable income, which is federal withholding. So you, so your charges continue on, and you report the taxable income on a 1040, and as we said, the 1040 ES. If you have a job, if you are working for yourself. a self-employed entrepreneur, then a 40, 1040 NR, a non-residential alien, would be used, along with a 1099 OID and a 1096. All taxable income must be reported to the IRS. All right? So, You've taken your credit card, even though it might be a debit card. We know that at the gas pumps, they'll ask you, is this a credit card or a debit card? You just simply hit credit. They ask you at the grocery store, is this a credit card or a debit card? You will hit credit, and you would do that for the year. If you have spent out rent, lease, payments for a car, for the house, and you do and you do so with the credit card, even if it's a debit card, you push credit. So all of the credit that you spend out over the year. By using the 1099 OID, you have the ability in order to collect that back. All taxable income must be reported to the IRS. The court still shows you owe the taxable income, which is the bill, the bond amount. And this is the detainer they use to hold your body with. So, court case, once again, they'll tell you, well, there's a true bill. That's the indictment. When you hear the word indictment, that's the true bill. You have been billed for those charges brought up against you. So, as Chief Fahim, Shechem Fahim stated, what his sister did. She stated specifically, no, I don't understand the charges being brought up against me. In other words, no, I do not stand under your jurisdiction. When you say that you understand the charges being brought up against you, then that means that you stand under the jurisdiction of the court, of the judge, and i.e., now your body has to suffer the consequences of your actions, and ignorance of the law is no excuse. So you think that day. now you fall on the dummy, which is i.e. artificial person, which is i.e. straw person, straw man. Remember? 
Yellow Brick Road. First artificial person, AI. The first AI that Dorothy met on the Yellow Brick Road was the Scarecrow, the Straw Man. The second AI that she met on the Yellow Brick Road, the robot slash the Tin Man taxpayer identification number, social security card. So the birth certificate, i.e. the Straw Man, and the social security card, T-I-N, Tin Man. Both of these artificial entities are attached to your body. Get it? They were attached to your body. You get it? <laughs> and when you violate the original contract, which is i.e. the birth certificate, which everything is predicated upon the birth certificate, what happens? You have to suffer the consequences with your body. Your body must suffer the consequences for your actions. Even if you was ignorant or not. Because ignorance of the law is no excuse except when you know the law and then you're excused. Hold up, I, I might have to say that part again. <laughs> okay. So. If you're going to dismiss, dismiss the charges being brought up against you in court, you use a 1099 OID or a 1099C for cancellation of debt. With a 1040 voucher, if it's federal, 273, 274, 275, bid bond, payment bond, and Bid bond, performance bond, and payment bond. If it's state, then it's a 24, 25, 25A. Bid bond, payment bond, excuse me, performance bond, payment bond. The 25A is the payment bond. 275 federal standard form. 275 is the federal form, and that is the Payment bond. The bid bond is the 24 at the state level. Standard form 24 is the bid bond. At the federal level, 273, 273, 273 is the bid bond. The performance bond is 25 at the state level. At the federal level, it is 274. Once again, the bid bond um, is 25, excuse me, 24 and 273, state and federal. The performance bond is 25 and 274, state and file, um, state and federal. And the payment bond is 25A and 275. Okay. Hopefully I um didn't confuse y'all. Uh, we got it. It. So we have, if you have state charges in court being brought up against you, you'll use those forms along with a 1099C or a 1099OID along with a 1040NR. You can also use a W8BEN or W8. You can also use a 1096, 1040 voucher in which that you would put the, the amount in which that they're charging you with. And you put the same amount on that bid bond because you are bidding for your body. You're bidding for your body, for not to be in jail or be in prison. That's what you're doing. You're bidding. It's a bid out. Right, because you're in a court. <laughs> right. Right, you own the court. The judge is the referee. 
There's a scrimmage taking place, which is a war, a battle. And you are against the state who's posing as the people. <clears throat> he's a he's a he's an attorney, he's a lawyer, he's a ex squire, he's a, a assistant DA or DA. All of them. Hey, God damn, how many jobs this how many hats do he wear? <laughs> how many jobs do he have? Plus he's the state and the people. <laughs> and little old you over there, you just ignorant. You're the dummy. You're a straw man. You're the artificial person. The AI. They turned you into an AI. So now as myself and and um brother um um Diamante was speaking about earlier before class got started, it was about the AI. They already turned us into AIs on paper. So now they're trying to turn you into AIs, literally. Elon Musk want to put a chip in the head of people. Well, I mean, we've seen all of this. Hell, I grew up during the time of the $6 million man, Steve Austin and um, Bionic Woman. You already was fusing your mind with technology and artificial. We can make them better. That's what they used to say during the intro of the of the six million dollar man. We can make him better. This is their this is their Albion European thought process. Because with artificial parts, you can have replacement, but yet there's a chip in your brain called the soul catcher chip. And it has all the downloads of your previous lives or memories on that chip. They can take that chip and put it in a whole nother body and you live again. Yep. That was yeah. Austin Carter. And that, they that call was that a creative movie. They call right. it sleeve. They call it sleeve. Yeah. The sleeve. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 And carbon, uh, um, that's what they call it. They call it they the call sleeve. It, um, they don't mm-hmm. call it. Di- uh, they call the thing a DHF, digital human freight. Right. It just puts you in a different body. Right. And that was in that creator movie with um, Denzel's son, John, in it, where when you when somebody died, they would take the chip, they download, put it in their brain, right. download, right. They download and they put the it chip. in another body, mm-hmm. and, and, and you, you come back to life for about 30 seconds, and then you die. Right. Crazy. Right. So that that is, I mean, that is actually what's happening. They've been working on the Soul Catcher chip since 1993, 94. This is real. So, Dr. Mm -hmm, Go ahead. So that's like artificial reincarnation, basically. Right. Artificial reincarnation, exactly. Right. <laughs> so it's called AR. <laughs> AR. <laughs> so this is their plan. And I speak about it in the book. Um Brother Joff, you, you received yours, right? Sure I did. Two done cool. All right, all right. A four. All right. Um you got a chance to look through it? Because that information that we talk about is in, actually in Chapter 12 right. about the soul catcher chip. Okay, I'm on Chapter 1. I'm going to read through Chapter oh, 1. So, 
Oh, I'm 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 talking about yeah for reading, but shoot, you got to breathe through it, got to look through it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they've been looking, but they've been working on this um, soul catcher chip since 1993-94. And they said they were going to have it done by in 15 years. All right? So from 94, 15 years would be what? 2009. Right, 2009. So 2009. If you go back, you start watching on uh, what was it called? Carbon weight? Arctic carbon. Arctic, Arctic carbon. That was around the same time when they put out the first one. Mm-hmm. Right? The second one is the one that they have now with the brother. Anthony. Right, Anthony um, Mackey. Yep. Who was in, um, um, he, he was in Leave it a Beaver. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but but y- y'all remember um, Rabbit? He was in Eight Miles with Rabbit. He yeah. was the dude at the end who was battling, you know, Clarence. Yeah. You know, yeah, he was he was the Clarence. He was Clarence. Clarence go to a really nice school. He stayed home with his mama. <laughs> you know, he ain't hard. So you remember Bunny Rabbit or Rabbit um, jumped all over him about that, you know. So, you know, this this is what's going on is the AI technology, and they're trying to bring it to you here and now. So this is what we have to um, look out for because they're trying to speedily do this. They already have um, nanobot technology in our bodies especially for those who have taken the jab. Okay. Um, and they already know who's who with, with the um, jabbage because it glows. It glows. It gives off a greenish glow, which is called luciferous. And another reason for that because they can mind control you by way of 5G. That's my my consort was telling me about with those um, those Gwen towers, ground yeah. wireless. Right, the Gwen, right, the Gwen yeah. tower. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was that broadcast you told us about months ago, too, with that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this is why we have to get our plan together. Because <laughs> we see their plan, and I don't like their plan at all. And I'm thinking that maybe y'all don't like the plan either. <laughs> so that means we got to get serious <laughs> about our plan and um, get our plan going, you know, and nationality and us doing what we are doing right now on one level is a plan. You know, we're not sitting by and by and just wishing for a white Jesus to come out the sky. Yeah. That's not what we're waiting for. Oh, before it get too bad, white Jesus is going to save me. <laughs> well, y'all keep waiting for that shit. Man, we gonna do this because there's nobody coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. And that I mean the second coming is not coming, Holly. <laughs> the second coming. Not- yeah, hell, they hell the Jews don't agree with the first coming. <laughs> the fake Jews, that Wait is. For the second- of Christ, brother. Right. You, you, you. No, no. Even the Jewish people are like, hold up, we don't know about this one. We don't know about this story. <laughs> mm. Gotta put the brakes on that kid. <laughs> we call Mary a whore and him a bastard. <laughs> put that in your Talmud. 
Put that in your Talmud. Oh, well, I'm going to get myself back out. <laughs> okay. The question, Dr. Mm-hmm. Lee. Yes. Yeah, to get back on the um, discharging. Uh, so when you open up that checking account, or even as you say, even if it's a debit account, that account should be in your straw man name. You should open an account in your straw name. No, 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 no. If you have anything that's in that straw name, you know, then yes, you use it um, by the way it was that you're referring to. But once you um, utilize your indigenous appellation, now if you're still working and you use it, using your indigenous appellation while working, then you have to use your indigenous appellation. Especially if you have credit cards and those different things in your indigenous appellation's name. If it's not in your birth name, then, you know, you can't use your birth name only if it's in the birth name. Okay. So my question is, I guess, once you open up your trust account, right, you don't, mm-hmm. need, to, oh, you don't need to open up an account in the corporation name. You can no. open up a cult in your appellation and still send in the 1040s. Right, because you, you would say that you are, um, for example, um, Joff um, Headley Bay is the authorized representative for Joff Headley. Right. So that would be on the, um, you're right, on the 1040 NR. Right. Oh, and for the yes. Right. Got you. Okay. Can anybody still see this? Ebo. Ebo. All right. So um, we're going to go over this information, dealing with DNA. In fact, um, I'm going to call this class the return of the particle, um, prodigal son. Um, uh, anybody remember the story in the Bible about the prodigal son? Yes. All right. Um, somebody break it down for me. Let me hear the science. Uh, I remember, well, when I was a little girl, um, my daddy was a preacher, so he would always buy us those videotapes. I can't remember the brand, but they had so many, like, Bible stories for kids. And I remember the videotape right. plan. And it was about a young man who left home, and I think he had, like, I think he kept getting tricked or something. He would just always fall on hard times, but his daddy gave him good um, good advice before he left. But, of course, being young, when he left his father's home, he got caught up, and that's all I really remember. He got caught up. Things would happen to him, bad things, and he finally came home, and his dad tried to tell him, and his dad helped him back up on his feet. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, essentially that's what happened. Um, and as the guy that said, he was young, dumb, and full of calm, and uh, <laughs> it set out in order to um, think that he was able to live his life at the at the fullest, but yet didn't realize there was things in which that you did not know, he did not know, you know, in which that um, led him to have to turn back and go back home. Um, in this in this particular class, on this particular subject topic today, um, it is symbolic to turn back to the ancestors. I will return back to the ancestors. This is Sankofa. Return, go back, look back. All right. So this is the return of the prodigal son, or Sankofa the return of the prodigal son. 
That's the name of this class for today. So I'm going to say that and begin because um, some things we're going to find out, which will put an end to a lot of the speculation and a lot of the dissension that have been um, that I've seen in the so-called conscious community over the last 20 years. All right, especially since um, Crown Prince Hutan Tupac Bey, formerly Ramesses Abel Bey, formed United Washington to become Unity Washington, um, which he was the Crown Prince, and as a Crown Prince, you are able to form your own providence. And hence, even though he was Washington, the Empress was in a nursing home. And at the time, nobody was doing anything because they didn't know what to do, number one, and they didn't have permission as far as the title was concerned to do anything. She gave him the title Crown Prince in 1999. In fact, on his born day, on his birthday, his solar return day, June 7th, all right, 1999, is when she gave him a Gemini. When she gave him the title Crown Prince. So we're going to look at information here and which that correlate to him telling me back in nineteen ninety five, ninety six that I need to put Prince on the beginning of my name. Of course at that time I was like, Ooh, boy, that's 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 a big um Title right there, that's big. I don't know if I'm ready for that. He passed in 2003, January 2003. The chiefs at that time called me and asked me to be put in his position. I was chief of information at that time, chief of information and propagandism, as he referred to it as. He had the Minister of Education, Ravana Bay, to come down from Chicago and bring me stacks of information concerning the Washington. From that stack of information, I became the, I guess, from what Sister Gladys told me, the most renowned um, scholar on the Washington. Now, why did all of this happen to me? You know, number one, I was wondering that as well. Hence, this lesson for today. I now have the answer, and you will too. So our ancestors are not dead and gone. They are buried in every gene, every cell, and in our very own DNA. And this is true because based from the African traditions, we are a concentration of seven generations on our mother's side, seven generations on our father's side, 14 generations. Keep that in mind. This is what is called immediate family members, Um, the consang you um nidity and the affinity. You are here in the middle. You have the first degree, second, third, or fourth degree. You have your spouse, first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree. So these are the step relations, step brothers, step fathers, etc., are considered to be the same as blood relations. Okay? Keep these positions in mind. You, in the middle, your parent, child, grandparents, brothers, sister, grandchild, second degree, third degree, great grandparent, aunt, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, grand, great, um, great grandchild, fourth degree, 
great grand a oh, great great grandparent great uncle great aunt excuse me and first cousin and grand nephew niece then you have first degree affinity your spouse and it goes in the same down it says parent in law daughter son in law second degree third degree grandparent in law brother sister in law grandchild in law third degree fourth degree great grand um great grandparents in law uncle aunt uncle in law first cousin in law niece nephew in law great grandchild in law Remember these positions. It's going to be very important because your ancestors are you. To listen to them, go within. Increase your awareness and listen to your in, in, um, intuition. This is from Ancestral Voices. Very good sight. In traditional African worldview, life is a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, meaning spirit never dies. Just a physics teaches us that energy is never destroyed, only transformed. The ancestors are no longer present in the physical, but still can communicate with their descendants and act as spiritual guardians. Now, this part is very important because this is how the particle son got led back to his father, symbolic to a person who believed that they was lost get returned back to the ancestors, the spiritual guardians, because they're always guarding you. They're always looking after you. They're always trying to communicate and bring you back to them. This is the science of the ancestors. This is why I keep telling you all, you must have an altar set up in your home. Because the ancestors help you in this life. Because you are a living representation of them. A concentration, a walking star, a walking sun, a talking sun of them. All that is in creation is never lost. Even when it decays, withers away, and is no longer discernible by our visible senses. Instead, it is transformed into another form of functions such that existence continuously replenishes itself. This understanding explains why reincarnation is accepted fact in African and diasporic, um, diasporic traditions. Indigenous people all over the world understand the science of reincarnation. Very important. The ancestors are always trying to lead you back to them, i.e., you, because you are the ancestors in concentrated physical form in the here and now. They are within you. This is where the Intel I gen come from, or Intel I genes. The Intel, the voices in your genes. That's what intelligence is. You're listening to the voices in your genes. That's intelligence when you listen to the voices in your genes. So, two years ago, April 2nd, 2021, I essentially began a search for my biological parents. Because I was adopted. And my mom told me at the age of 11 that I was adopted. So out of respect for her, I did not begin my search until after she passed. Because she was the only mother that I knew. Because she adopted me at three months. So it's not like I was at an orphanage. 
or anything like that. I was three months. I wasn't even cognitive. Aware. But she took me as her own and raised me, provided for me. And I thank her so much for that. But August 2019, she transitioned from from life on planet Earth into the astral planes. So April the 2nd, 2021, and actually it wasn't until this year of 2021 that the records in New York was unsealed so that any person who was adopted could have their records in order to see what was going on So this is what happened. My birth name from my adopted mother was Leanda Dancy, Leanda Jerome Dancy. So this is what it says. Dear Leander, thank you for choosing Omnitrace Corp to aid you in your search for your biological family members. As you are already aware, there are many difficulties that accompany um, such as such an endeavor. While we will strive to do the vast majority of the work ourselves, we may occasionally need your support and efforts in order for us to complete a successful search. We must first gather as much information regarding the birth and adoption as possible. Also, we will need to be legally authorized by you to act on your behalf. All the information that we will obtain is confidential and will only be released to you. We will make every effort to be discreet when conducting your search. Your search. You're complete, completing this package is crucial step towards reuniting you with your biological family. On the following page is a list of forms. Um, simply follow the instructions and then mail the documents as indicated back to Omnitrace as your earliest possible convenience. Also, please include copies of any information you may currently have regarding the adoption, which I had none at that time. Zero, zilch, nada. Retrieving all necessary information for a search can be a slow process. It may take several weeks or even months before we receive all the necessary responses. If you have any questions or would like to know the status of your search, of your search, please send an email to um, customercare at omnitrace.com or call us toll free at 888-965-6696. We look forward to a successful resolution to your file. Thank you. Chris um, Mayon or Mayor One. So, this is me contacting them, as you see here. Um, thank you for choosing Omnitrace. Um, dear Leander, thank you for choosing Omnitrace to help you search for your biological family. Um, this is when they sent me the package. So, I'm showing you what was written from Chris Maywan and Vicky Capote. This is another letter here, Omnitrace. Um, Irene Johnson, good afternoon, Leander. I hope this email finds you well. I receive your message requesting your um, an update. It typically, it typically um, as you see here, is May 13th now, uh, a month, um, month, almost a month and a half later. And uh, so it's going on five weeks. It says we typically ask for about eight to ten weeks for the time we receive the package before we, uh, requesting a uh, first update that we give time to conduct some primary searches, send out requests for additional information, and receive responses back from those requests. We send out two requests. One is in your 
pre-adoption birth certificate, referred to as your OBC, original birth certificate. This will provide us with your biological mother's name at the time, age, state of birth, address at the time, and your father's name and age if she listed it, and she did. So I got back an unsealed record with no mother's name, no father's name on it. The second request is your non-identifying information. This is your background information on your biological parents. The requests for both of these, um, responses for both of these uh, requests will go directly to you. So please follow a uh, forward a copy as soon as possible, as, or as soon as you can receive a response. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Kind regards, Irene Johnson, investigator. Omni Trace Corporation, um, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened is, real simple, I had to contact the adoption agency in New York City. And this was the New York Foundland which deals with adoptions. And it says, Dear Mr. Dancy, thank you for reaching out to the New York Foundling, Foundling as an adoptee. New York State prohibits the release of identifying information. We can only provide the admissions date, discharge date, redacted medical information, and baptismal information, if available. Should you want a copy of your original birth certificate, you would need to contact the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which I did. As you see here, a mission date, 4-19-1969, which became my birthday. Discharge date, 8-5-1969, is when they released me into my adopted mother's hands, all right, and my adopted father. My mother, adopted mother, was Agnes Marie Dancy. My adopted father was Jesse Lee Dancy, all right. My mother's maiden name, um, adopted maiden name, was High. My mother's, well, my adopted mother's maiden name was High, H-I-G-H. All right, so, um, and we related to the Lawrence um, Green, so forth and so on. So, it says here there is no additional non identifying information. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at 212 727 6923 or email me, Jennifer um, um, Simonetti, Simonetti, all right, at New York Foundling, all right. So I contacted the Department of Health Bureau of Vital Records. And this is what I ended up getting was an unsealed pre-adoption birth record. This is not the current record on file. This is a report of fouling. So they found me at, as you see here, Manhattan, New York, at 800 Riverside Drive. 800 Riverside Drive. And the name that they assigned me was Gregory Allen. Gregory Allen. <laughs> so, sex male, appointed date of birth, April the 19th, 1969, on April the 21st, 1969, child was found at above address, which is 800 Riverside Drive, and taken to Columbian Medical Center. 
After examination, child was transferred to the New York Fowling Hospital and admitted. So the New York Fowling Hospital, um, a New York Fowling is a hospital and it is also an adoption agency. Okay. Here, the City of New York Department of Health Bureau of Vital Records, Notification of Order of Adoption. All right. Come down. It says here, to the Commissioners of Health of the City of New York, pursuant to Section 254 of the Judiciary Law and amended by Chapter 681 of the Laws of 1949, I, Kevin C. Fogarty, clerk of the um, surrogates court, County of King, do hereby notify the Commissioner of Health of the City of New York that on December 13, 1971, and the order of adoption was issued by Honorable Nathaniel R. Sobal and the clerk grievance of um, granting, excuse me, the petition of Jesse Lee Dancy and Agnes Dancy to adopt a child alleged to have been born in the bureau, um, borough of Manhattan in the city of New York on April 19th, 1969 and named or birth Gregory Allen. So it says here, they changed the name. The order directs that the same of the um that the name of the same child shall be changed to Leander Jerome Dancy. So the Fallon Hospital Adoption Agency gave me the name Gregory Allen. Okay. My adopted mother and father changed it to Leander Jerome Dancy. Now, you'll find out that my actual name from my mother was Damien Days Butler. All right? Her last name was Days, D-A-I-S. My father's name was Butler, B-U-T-L-E-R. And she said the name that she chose for me was Damien. Okay? Now... If you look up um, Gregory Allen, Leander Jerome Dancy, um, even Osara Aline, New Tupac El Bay, these names correlate to a special mission. No matter, in other words, I couldn't get away from the mission no matter what name I was given. Leander, for example, means lion man, L-I-O-N, a lion. <laughs> a lion man, and then Jerome means a holy man. And then Dancy, of course, you can shorten that to dance, to move, to make moves, to uh, Dan, D-A-N, which means judge, or Hebrew, that's the Hebrew for judge. Dan, Dan was one of the 12 sons of Israel, or Jacob. Okay? So, we look in here, it says to be filed to the Department of Health is provided by law December the 15th, 1970, yeah, not 13th, 15th, 1971. It says we, the undersigned adoptive parents of Leander Jerome Dancy, certify the request the clerk of the surrogate court. Now, the crazy thing is that my aunt, my biological aunt, my aunt, the full biological sister of my mother, she was a surrogate um, clerk of the, in the surrogate court. She worked in the um, court system. All right, that that was that was that was something too. But we continue on. I want to be too long winded on this, but we're gonna get to the science here. All right, so 
as you see here, April the 19th, 1969 is underlined. That's when they say I was born, Leander Jerome Dancy. As you see here, uh, my mother, adopted mother, Agnes Marie Dancy, my adopted father, Jesse Lee Dancy. And as you see, Wilmington, North Carolina was where my mother was born, adopted mother was born, and where my adopted father was born was Rocky Mountain, or Rocky Mount, North Carolina. So they had ties right here in North Carolina, but yet lived in New York. All right. My biological family also had ties here in North Carolina and lived in New York. So here we have Department of Health. It says, dear Mr. Dancy, your application to the New York State Department of Health Adoption and Medical Information Registry was received. The adoption registry is authorized to release certain information to adoptees who were both born and adopted in, North, in the New York State. As soon as the adoption registry obtained available non-identifying information about your adoption, a report will be sent to you. This may take several months, and it did. But please be assured we are processing your request and we'll contact you as soon as possible. Now, as you see, this is May 11th, 2021. So that actually was part, all right, of this. This, this is what I received right before I received this email right here from Irene Johnson. And I finally got right here the unsealed pre-adoption on records. Okay. So, what did I find out? Nothing. Zilch. I didn't find anything out, y'all. All of this writing back and forth to the adoption agencies, to the health, um, to the vital records, health and vital records of New York and so forth and so on, and to the adoption agency and so, you know, found nothing. So it says, yes, it is odd and somewhat confusing. I was allegedly abandoned, but yet my name um, at birth is Gregory Allen. Hmm. My name at birth is more than my adoption mom, my adopted mom would tell me. And I guess you're right that the other option is a DNA test of sorts. I've never done one. Which um, one do you think is best? In other words, provide the most um, information or the best information in this regard. She said, hi, Osaru. Um, Ancestry and 23andMe are both great for DNA matches. They're the most popular. So you have a great chance of both connecting with, your, with more DNA matches as well as a greater chance of connecting with those or with close DNA matches. I think Ancestry is best overall for identifying and locating family because Ancestry shows members to create family trees, which provide us with a lot more data to work with. Now, keep all of this in mind, y'all. We will cover the cost of a basic DNA kit with st standard shipping. So they paid for it because they couldn't find any information themselves. I couldn't find any information. They paid, they paid for me to get the test. Just forward us a copy of the receipt and we'll uh, mail you a reimbursement check. www.ancestry.com backslash DNA. Please let me know if you have any questions about how it works or what to expect. Now, I sent her, I said, um, greetings, Erin. Uh, I just purchased the Ancestry kit from. Um, Ancestry.com is the receipt. Thank you very much for um, having a next step for some reason. I figured that it's going to come to this. It was going to come to this. I figured it was going to come to this. Thank you once again. All right. So I put down Dr. Sorry Lee Mel Bay, Leanna Jerome Dancy, uh, Gregory Allen, because I didn't know at the time if that even had any relevance or not. But here, as you see, um, 
Um, it was $208.95, and I sent it to her, and they sent me the check. So as soon as I get on Ancestry.com, what happens? I find my aunt. As soon as I get on Ancestry.com, I find my mother's sister, my aunt, 1,995 CMs, which is called Sentiment Morgans, 29% shared DNA. So 30% shared DNA. My maternal my maternal side, my mother, sister. I found her as soon as I got on. So guess what? I looked up Cecilia days and got the phone number and called her. Left a message because I was so nervous. She called back. And my wife talked to her. And she was like, yeah, call me. You know, New York New York, New York accent. <laughs> and I called. And we hit it off. And we've been writing each other ever since. She's 76 years old. So she was the first family member that I that I actually met, my biological family that I actually met, and she broke down the things in which that took place and what happened. My father was five years older than my mother, and he ends up marrying another woman, producing me. My mother was young, and she got accepted into. Howard University at the age of 15. So she was going to college at 15. So another example of young, dumb, and full of calm, as they say. So I ended up getting 23 and me. Since she mentioned 23 and me, I said, shoot, I'll go to 23 and me. And guess who pops up again? My aunt. <laughs> in which that verified the fact that she's my aunt, but also 27.77, so 28% DNA shared, or basically just say 20, um, just say 30%, as we say, and 59 segments. As you can see, that's me up there in the upper right-hand corner. So Ancestry.com verified it, and so did 23andMe. So when people say DNA tests don't work, then how did I find my family? They were sadly mistaken. DNA forensics, DNA testing. Sometimes they do a small percentage, but if you can find a site in which that does more than just 1% of DNA testing, you'll find a whole lot of information about yourself that you never knew, about your ancestry, about your lineage, your heritage, Things that you never knew. I'm still being marveled by what I'm finding. So I, my aunt told me that my mother did DNA tests as well. Well, I couldn't find her. She was not on um, Ancestry.com. She was not on um, 23andMe. So I end up doing family tree DNA, and guess who pops up? My mother, Emily Felina Days, the sister to Cecilia Days. And it tells me that her haplogroup, mitochondrial DNA, was L1. What is the relationship range? It can only have been parent-child. 
because the share of DNA is 3,545 centimorgans. The longest block is 276 centimorgans. X match is 178 centimorgans. So first I found my aunt being verified by Ancestry.com and being verified by 23andMe. I get on Family Tree DNA and my mother is there and is verified once again. So I send this information to my aunt because she didn't know. Um, she knew that my mother did a DNA test, but she didn't know um, which ones. Well, this is at least one of the ones that she did. So they was leaving me breadcrumbs because they found my sister. My sister was left at the same place, 800 Riverside Drive in Manhattan, which is in Washington Heights, which is outside of Sugar Hill and Harlem, part of Harlem, going up towards the Bronx. Still across the river on the side of Manhattan, not across the Bronx Bridge. So once again, when they say DNA tests don't work, somebody has lost their mind. You can find more information. Remember, the whole signs of being on planet Earth is to know thyself. How can you know yourself if you don't even know your heritage? You don't know your haplogroup. You don't know your blood type. You don't know your blood lineage, your bloodline. But yet, you know metaphysics, yet you know various languages. You said know everything else, but I don't know who they are. Uh, right. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And we shouldn't be this way. So, the real royal house of Turnica, Turner. Why is this the real royal house? Well, we'll explain it as we go along. If you look up the United States birth certificates, this is the history of the birth certificates. You might not know what I'm getting ready to go over, but look it up. The history of the birth certificates might not seem like much, but it marks a vitally important milestone in the country's development and growth. Birth certificates are with you from the first day of your life. However, despite this seeming longevity, the life story of birth certificates only began quite recently. All right, so much of the dates in which that we have for those before the birth certificates might not be accurate. Much of the time span might not be accurate. And that's fine. We can approximate based on the fact that we don't have a birth certificate. And so this is what some of the records shows because some things was written in the Bible. See, Families used to have a family Bible before the birth certificates became popular in the 20th century. To explore how this came to be and how they grew to become a essential vital record in America, this article looks back over the history of the birth certificate to explain why birth certificates are quite important today. How did birth registration work before birth certificates? Birth records have been kept by governments around the world for thousands of years. This was primarily done to ensure authorities have a clear idea about their production output and taxable population. However, once birth certificates and other vital records like marriage and deaths have been collected by governments for a long time, birth certificates are still a relatively new phenomenon. Before birth certificates were made the norm, information on births was kept in church records. You get it? However, this was not a formalized process, and there is no laws mandating 
when and how exactly a person should be legally recorded. Okay? So matters was also complicated by the nature of giving birth in olden day, olden times. Unlike today, most children weren't born in the hospitals. Unlike today, most children weren't born in hospitals. And unfortunately, many didn't survive infancy. This meant some records for people born at the time simply weren't kept at all. When were birth certificates first used? Considering how far back birth certificates go, it's surprised that the birth certificate only started appearing around middle of the 19th century. In 1853, the United Kingdom centralized and formalized its birth certificate keeping. It was the first country to do so, and eventually other nations would start adoption, adopting similar methods. These were a few reasons having standardized birth certificates became beneficial for countries, including documenting large waves of European immigration across the Atlantic from the 19th century onward, gain a better understanding of population demographics, monitoring um, national public health needs. The United States, however, was a bit different. Instead of centralized system for collecting birth certificates or birth information, individual um, states collected their own records. There was no federal requirement for them to do so. However, and not and no standard way of recording birth certificate on birth on recording births. All right, so do this since it wasn't until nineteen oh two, however, that the United States introduced a nationally uh, regulated process at a federal level. This was overseen at first by the Bureau of Census. At this point, a standard a standard form was produced by recording births in each state, although state governments still had overall control over the issuance of birth certificates. This is still true today. Official recordings of vital records by United States, each United States started recording vital records individually and at different times. The tablet um, table below shows when each state began officially recording vital events in the form of birth, marriage, and birth certificates. So here, um, I'm going to deal mostly with the birth certificate, okay? Alabama, 1903. Alaska, 1913. Arizona, 1909. Arkansas, 1914. California, 1950, uh, 1905. Colorado, 1907. Connecticut, 1897. Delaware, 1861. District of Columbia, 1874. Florida, 1899. Georgia, 1919. Hawaii, 1842. Idaho, Idaho, 1911. Illinois, 1916. Indiana, 1907. Iowa, 1818. Uh, 1880, excuse me. Kansas, 1911. Louisiana, 1914. Remember this. They didn't start recording birth certificates in Louisiana until 1914. 1914. Maine, 1892, Maryland, 1898, Massachusetts, 1841, Michigan, 1867, Minnesota, 1900, Mississippi, 1912, Missouri, 1910, Montana, 1907, Nebraska, 1905, Nevada, 1911, New Hampshire, 1901. New Jersey, 1848. New Mexico, 1920. New York, 1880. All right? Remember this about New York, 1880. Remember this about North Carolina, 1913. 
All right. Louisiana, 1914. New York, 1880. North Carolina, 1913. Remember those dates. North Dakota, 1907. Ohio, 1908. Oklahoma, 1908. Oregon, 1903. Pennsylvania, 1906. Rhode Island, 1853. South Carolina, 1915. Um, South Dakota, 1905. Tennessee, 1908. Texas, 1903. Utah, 1905. Vermont, 1955. Virginia, remember Virginia, 1912. 1912, y'all. Washington State, 1907. West Virginia, 1917. Wisconsin, 1907. Wyoming, 1909. All right. It says between 1902 to 1946, increase in government oversight of birth, of birth data. All right. By 1946, birth certificates are regularized in America. So, we go to the return of the ancient ones. The United States government assumed military control over North America, east of the Mississippi River, pursuant to the Treaty of Paris of 1783, United States Incorporation of 1789, the former British Quebec, Louisiana, 1774-1789, became United States Northwest Territory, North of Ohio River, while the Louisiana South of the Ohio River became United States Southwest Territory, United States Southwest, and United States Northwest Ordinance of Corporate United States Government. Meanwhile, the Treaty of San Lorenzo, 1795, also known as the Piccany Treaty, reestablished the 13th or the 31st, excuse me, parallel at the, um, as the southern boundary of the United States of America, acknowledging the Spanish Flores and the Spanish Louisiana west of the Mississippi River. The Spanish de Bourbon would now serve as the protectorate of the lands and sovereignty of the Washington Nation of Moors. Given the secret treaty of San Ildefonso of 1800, the de Bourbon, Charles the Fourth, King of Spain, succeeded the French Emperor Napoleon I Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon and Charles the Fourth, King of Spain, both of them was Moors. They was melanated. All right, this is told to us in several books, and I mentioned the name of those books. If those want to, for those who want to write it down. The first book is The Negro Question, Part 2, The African Slave Ships That Came from Judah by Lee Cummins. And the other book would be The Negro Question, Part 4, The Missing Link. Britain, Irish, and Scotland, The King of Scott um, by Lee Cummins. Okay. Now, it goes on. The Spanish de Bourbon would serve as the protectorate of the lands and sovereignty of the Washington Nation of Moors. Given the secret treaty of San Ildefonso of 1800, the de Bourbon, um, Charles IV, King of Spain, succeeded to the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, um, the seaport city of New Orleans only and a couple of barracks and streets, such as Bourbon Street, named after the Bourbon Charles IV, King of Spain. The whole of Spanish Louisiana was not conveyed or transferred to Napoleon I. So when Napoleon um, succeeded the port city of New Orleans to the United States um, President Thomas Jefferson as the so-called Louisiana um, purchase Treaty of 1803. Now, Thomas Jefferson was also in more. All right. 
The whole of Louisiana west of the Mississippi River was not included. This fact had been secured in the original documents. These are documents that we need to look up when we go to the Library of Congress. The secret treaty of San Il Defonso on October the 1st, 1800, and also the treaty, secret treaty of San Il Defonso on 1762 for the Imperial Spanish land grant conveyed to the French crown in the person of Louis the 16th. Meanwhile, given the death of both the heirs of the French throne, Louis the 16th, no, 17th, the heir um, and the heiress of the Watchtower throne, Annie Maria, the title of Louisiana Dauphin, and Regent. Marquise de Maison Rouge was conveyed to the next in line to the imperial French crown, Louis Francis Joseph de Bourbon, Prince of de Conti, 1734-1814, and the son of Louis, or Louis Francis de Bourbon, Prince of de Conti, 1717-1776. Louis the 17th and Annie Maria have been wedded in 1795, and now their daughter, Annie Maria, would be wed to Joseph de Bourbon, Prince of De Conti, and second daughter of Louis um, 17, and Annie Maria um, Lulia Daniel was to be wed to the French nobleman, Louis um, Boligny Garrison, as the second Marquise de Maison Rouge. Joseph de Mason, uh, excuse me, Joseph de Bourbon became the recipient of both the Imperial Spanish Land Grant of 1762 and Spanish Land Grant of Monroe, Louisiana. With the death of Joseph de Bourbon in 1814, his eldest son, Henry Joseph Turner, inherited the Mason Rouge estate. All right. Mahalia Garrison, the eldest daughter of Louis Boligny Garrison and um, Lulia Daniel, became the next empress of the Washington. Meanwhile, Henry Joseph Turner, the eldest son of the second Marquis de Maison Rouge, Louis Francisco, let me see if we can get this a little bit bigger here. De Bourbon, Joseph de Bourbon, Prince de Conti, and Anna Maria, the emperors of the Turnica, of course, the Washington. Henry Joseph Turner became the recipient of the 1762 and 1795 Imperial Spanish land grants, the third Marquise de Maison Rouge. Mahalia Garrison married William Bill Kim's Badger, and from this union will come their eldest son, Isham Washington, Washington. Henry Joseph Turner, 1844, married Sarah Turnica, or Turner. And from this union will come the eldest son, Joseph Henry Turner, the fourth Marquise de Maison Rouge. Isham Washington will marry Delphi Kim Badger, 1850 um, to 1967. And from this union will come the eldest son, Frederick um, Houston Washington. Joseph Henry Turner, whose sister is Eliza Turner, the mother of Prophet Noble, the mother of Prophet Noble Drew Ali will marry Matilda, and from this union, there come the eldest daughter Annie Frankie Turner. Okay, Frederick Henry Washington, Regent of the Empire of Washington, D. Dr. Manya, will marry Annie Frankie Turner, the recipient of the 1762 and 1795 Spanish land grants, and the heirs of the Henry Joseph. Turner Estate. The eldest daughter of Frederick and Frankie is the current Imperial Empress of the Washington, Verdiasi Tierra Washington, Gaston L. Bay. Verdiasi is married to John Gaston, the son of Corella Turner. And Corella is the daughter of Eliza Turner. Eliza is the mother of Prophet Nobudra Ali. Corella and Drew Ali are brothers and sisters. Eliza is the daughter of 
Sarah Turner, and Henry Joseph Turner. John Gaston had been the sixth Marquise de Maison Rouge after Noble Drali, who had been the fifth Marquise de Maison Rouge, a direct descendant of Louis the Seventeenth and Annie Maria Verdiasi Tierra, born May 4, 1927, is the sovereign, the United States Court Case number 31 and 191 of 1948, 1848 actually, United States versus the Henry Turner heirs confirmed the estate of the Washington 68,883 acres of land constituting the northern half of the present state of Louisiana. And he's going to go for the whole um, 13 more states on up into almost the whole of Canada, which would render over 30 million acres of land. And we're still going to do that. The land is the personal and private property of the Empress heir to the 1795 Spanish land grant Maison Rouge. The land now serves as the capital area Washington proper of a much larger land claim. In the context of international law, the Washington has established itself as a sovereign independent nation, United Washington, um, excuse me, um, where am I? Um, United Nations, um, NIS 21, right slash 593. And of course, um, we have the um, United Nations seat, um, 215, right slash 93. Apart from the Corporate Union of 1781 and the Corporate United States 1787, the land claims of the Washington has been affirmed by the Spanish and French, as well as the British pursuant to Spanish land grant 1762 and 1795. In the context of the United States federal law, law of the um, land of the Washington has been uh, defi um, defined as Indian country, and the people regarded as Indian. Both the people and their land have been placed under the authority of the United States government via the Bureau of, Indiv of Indian Affairs within the Department of Interior, which was governed by both the executive office um, and legislative office of the United States. Now, this is also from Return of the Ancient Ones. This is the true history uncovered of the Washington Didac Maya Empire. Empress Verdiasi of the Black Washita Empire. The state of Louisiana was originally stolen and illegally sold as the Louisiana Purchase. The land is the stolen property of the Ancient Ones, Washita Empire, the Ancient Ones, the Washita Files. Now, when you read this book, she breaks down. My only son, Mr. Frederick Joe Washington, grandchildren, Frederick N. Washington, Wendy um, Ferrica Washington, Eric Washington, daughter-in-law, Georgia Deanne Washington, sister, Matilda, Matilda Francis Butler, that was the first clue, that's why that um, Butler is underlined is because my family married into the Washita, but I am also a descendant of the Washita at the same time. So this is ill. You're going to see something here, brother. I some Joe Turner Washington, nephew Albert Charles Gray II, Fred Albert Washington. Michael Washington, nephews, niece, Annie, right here, Laverne, Washington, Linda Butler, all right, Linda Butler, Butler, Monica Warfer, Harriet M. Huddleston, grandnephews, Albert and Charles Gray III, Marty Mills, Michael Mills, which my family also have mills in it as well. In fact, you will see these connections in a minute. Grand nieces, because it's the same family, as you'll see. Grand nieces, Kathleen, Evelyn, Riley, Angela, Michelle Gray, Monique, Wuffer, 
Stephanie throwing the waffer. Bobby Jean, good joint. Marianne, good joint. Julian G. Johnson, Doshia, good joint. Great Grand, Erica Monet Gray, Ashley Laverne Claiborne. The descendants of Annie Turner Washington and Frederick Houston Washington. My paternal Grand Isham Washington, Delphi Kim Washington, and my maternal Grand Joe Henry Washington and Matilda M. Washington, or Turner in this case. So this is the marriage of the Turner and the Washingtons, as you see here. Now, my father was Ronald Butler, and thus related to the Empress sister by way of marriage. But we're going to see something even more interesting. All right? Now, you see Henry J. Turner, where the arrow is? That is my four times great grand uncle and aunt. Okay? My three times great grand aunt and uncle is Eliza Turner and John W. Drew. My biological Great grandfather is Frederick D. Drew, who is the brother to John W. Drew. Eliza Turner, and who is their child? Prophet Noble Drew Ali, as the Empress stated. So once again, my fa my great grandfather three times, great-grandfather is Frederick D. Drew, who's the brother to John W. Drew, who's the father of Noble Drew Ali. We come down. So Noble Drew Ali is my first cousin, four times removed. His sister, Corella Drew, who, be, who married Johnny Ghostin, senior, produced who? The Empress, Verdiasi, Tierra, Washington, Gaston L. Bay. Prophet Noble Drew's Ali's niece. by marriage and nephew by biology is Johnny Lewis or John Lewis Gaston Jr. who married the Empress Verdiasi Tierra Washington Gaston L. Bay. You see? Noble Drali and his sister Corella Drew Gaston Or my first cousins, four times removed. Their first cousin is my two times great grandmother, which is Sarah Drew, which is here. Sarah Drew married right here, Samuel Trait, Trent. Their daughter was Emily Lee Trent. Their son was Joseph J. Butler. All right, excuse me. Um, their daughter, excuse me, was Eleanor E. Morton. All right. Joseph J. Butler and Eleanor E. Morton produced my father, who is Ronald J. Butler, Ronald Joseph Butler. And as you see here, this is me at the bottom here. 
So once again, me, my father, mother, Emily Days, Ronald Joseph Butler, Joseph J. Butler, Eleanor E. Morton, my, my grandmother's mother, or my great-grandmother is Emily Lee, or uh, Emily uh, Trent, who is the daughter of Samuel Trent and Sarah Drew. Sarah Drew is the first cousin to Corella Drew Gulston and Noble Drew Ali. First cousins. Here's why Prophet Noble Drew Ali is my first cousin four times removed. This is Return of the Prodigal Son because I never would have known this if I did not know that I was what? Adopted. I would not have known this if they did not unseal the birth certificate in New York City in 2021. So as you see here, So, Johnny Gaston, who was, if you don't know, John Gaston was, he received, he was the sixth Marquis of, of Maison de Rouge. He was the sixth Marquis. John Gaston was the sixth Marquis who was married to Verdiasi, the Empress. It was my it was my first cousin three times removed, y'all. John Lewis, Gaston, my first cousin, three times removed. You get that? Who married Verdiasi, the Empress? Their son, Frederick Joe Washington, is my first cousin two times removed. Who calls himself now King Joe? <laughs> and that's why I have no problem being the crown prince. Same family. The present empress, Wendy, Erica, Washington, is my first cousin one times removed. And then we have right here, Lemon Butler, who daughter, well, Linda Butler and Matilda, Matilda Washington. Now, Matilda Washington is the sister to Rodiasi. My father's people married back into the Washingtons and Turners, and here he is, Lemon Butler, and they produce Linda J. Butler. So Linda J. Butler and Lemon Butler are both related to Joseph J. Butler, who is my grandfather, and Ronald J. Butler, who is my father, and me, who is Damien Day Butler. <laughs> my biological name by my mother, that is. By my ma biological mother, that is. And here's a better picture. Ronald J. Butler, my father, this is me. Now, something remarkable is that Noble Drali is my first cousin four times removed. The Empress, <laughs> as you've seen, it 
is my first cousin by marriage. Three times removed. John Gaston, who was the six was the um six more keys of the Mason Rouge, was my first cousin three times removed. So I remember Brother Joff asked me last week, well, what does that mean for you? What do, what does that stand for you? Well, that means that I would be a Marquise of Mason de Rouge. I sit in that lineage. So I'm crown prince as well as now did anyone know I didn't know this information, y'all. This is what I'm talking about, the ancestors. I didn't know I was part of the family. I just knew I was given positions in which that I knew I had to do something with. I couldn't just sit there. That was what motivates you to take on that job, brother. You didn't know. Yeah. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. Right. So that's what I mean what? by the ancestors. The ancestors are always trying to lead you back to them. You might get off track, but if you are acknowledging the ancestors, they will lead you back to them. I had my altar set up. I had the empress uh -huh. on my altar. I put the empress on my altar. I can show you my altar right now, and you can see the empress on my altar. You can see um, uh, all these various connections. Noble Drew, Noble Drew Ali is on my altar. They let me back to them genetically. This is why the empress came to me, and when she said you wasn't doing enough, I thought she meant, you know, with the nation or whatever. No, she meant that I wasn't digging deep enough. I was not looking for these connections. This is what she was telling me. That's not a coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence. No. no. No such thing. And this is how I know the ancestors are real, y'all. This shit is real. They exist after the yeah. after this after the so-called here and now. And they will continue to guide you along the way if you just listen. Did you know that my son's mom? Coralie Burnett, who is right here to the right of me, do you know that her cousin is no is um Marcus Garvey? So my son has the genetics of Marcus Garvey and the genetics of Noble Drali. He has the genetics of the damn reincarnated, he of the forerunner and the um and the um prophet. God damn. You dropping Full some heat, circle. Doc. You dropping some Full heat circle, tonight. Yo. Full circle. Now you know that 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 Nova Drali um mentions Marcus Garvey as the forerunner and he himself as the one who would come after the forerunner. Now here my son is the genetics of both these brothers. Both these cousins of his. Both of the families lies within my son. This is fascinating, y'all. This is fascinating. Because the ancestors are always trying to lead you back to them, no matter what you do. This is about you and them. You can deny it all you want. I'm 50 some odd years old and I, I I can't deny it no longer, y'all. This is what they did. They put me in full circle back to them. I remember about 14, I was about 14 years old and I remember internally the ancestor told me that there was a woman in Louisiana who had land. I didn't know what the heck they was talking about. I thought the shit, I thought, hell, I thought I heard somebody say to my family, my adopted family or something. Because I was reading about Juneteenth because my aunt 
um, bought a um, post about Juneteenth. And I was reading about the Juneteenth information, and then all of a sudden, this, this is the conversation that I was having with one of the ancestors inside of me in my head. And I didn't know what the hell they was talking about. Like, a woman in Louisiana got some land. Okay, all right, what, you know, whatever. I kept it in the back of my mind. But I was 14. Well, what the hell was it? What, what, what was I going to do with the information at 14 damn years old in 1983? Huh? The Empress didn't even um get the seat at the um United Nations until ten years later, until nineteen ninety three, y'all. <laughs> but the ancestors are always preparing you. Always preparing you. This is a this is a fast fascinating, fantastic thing called life, y'all. If you don't believe in the ancestors, I can't convince you, but I know one hundred percent I do. One hundred percent. How did this happen? This is fascinating, y'all. Look here. This is a condensed version of everything that I'm telling you. You can't see it too well. Right here, you might be able to see a little bit better now. All right. If you can see right here at the top, that's the first circle is Frederick D. Drew. Okay. His brother is John Washington Drew. Okay. John Washington Drew is the brother to Frederick D. Drew, and John Washington Drew married Eliza Turner. Who son became prophet over Ali? Whose sister is Corella Turner Drew? Who son is Johnny Gaston, who married the Empress Verdiasi? Who son is Frederick Joe Washington? Who cousin is Linda J. Butler? Who is my cousin on both sides, through the Butler family and through the Drew family? Matilda Washington, whose daughter is Linda Butler, married Matilda married Lemon or Lemon Butler and Matilda and Verdiasio sisters. Now I'm gonna go out some for so your casitas. This is me down here where the arrow is pointing at. This is my father here, which I showed a picture of. My father and Wendy are first cousins. Wendy is the present day 
Empress. So she's my she is my father's first cousin. And she's one. Um, she's my first cousin one times removed. You see, she's my first cousin one time removed. Joe is my first cousin one time two times removed. Okay, Linda, Jay Butler is my first cousin two times removed. And plus related through my father, who is also a butler. The Empress. All right. And Joe, or Johnny, excuse me, right here, John Gaston, is my first cousin three times removed, who married the Empress, who's my first cousin three times removed by marriage, but she is also a Turner, so she's also related on that side as well. All right? And then we have Nobudra Ali, who's my first cousin, four times removed. So this is me. So one, two, three, four. There it is. One, two, three, four. And see, I had a sister who... um who specifically asked me to go over this information on how I was related to the Empress and related to Nobudra Ali, related to this family line. Now I know specifically and show you the names of all the people. Okay? So here, me, Ronald J. Butler, Eleanor E. Morton, Emily Lee Trent. And who is this? This is me, Sorelli Mel Bay, my father, Ronald J. Butler, my grandmother, paternal grandmother, Eleanor Morton, my great-grandmother, Eleanor Lee, Emily Trenton, and then my second great-grandmother is Sarah Drew. All right, Sarah Drew. And then my third great-grandfather is Frederick D. Drew, who is the brother to John W. Drew, who married Corella. No, excuse me, I'm sorry. You go here. Let's get it correct, because you got a lot of them with the same names, y'all. All right, so here. Frederick D. Drew is the brother who's my um, three times great-grandfather. Brother is John W. Drew, who is married to Eliza Turner. Okay, who's married to Eliza Turner, y'all? Now, who's Eliza Turner? She was in the landmark case of the Washita. Henry J. Turner, landmark case of the Washita, and once again, this is my three times great grand aunt and uncle, John W. Drew. Eliza Turner. My four times great grand uncle and aunt is Henry J. Turner. Sarah Turner. Okay? So I am in the family. There's no doubt about it now. No doubt about it. And wonder why I would go so hard for the Washita. Now it makes all the sense in the world. So you are the son of Ronald J. Butler, of Sarah Lee Mel Bay, 
Ronald J. Butler is the son of Eleanor Elizabeth Morton. Eleanor um, is the daughter of Emily Drew Trent, and she is the daughter of Sarah Drew Hobson, who's the daughter of Frederick D. Drew, and Frederick D. Drew is the um, son of Daphne Drew, um, and Daphne Drew is the mother of John W. Drew, and John W. Drew is the husband of Eliza Turner. And Eliza Turner is the, um, um, is the daughter of Henry Joseph Turner. And Henry Joseph Turner is father-in-law of third great-grand-uncle. This is the relationship to me. This is my direct lineage to those who names are on that we've been reading all this time about. You see? Eliza Turner, Henry Joseph Turner, the names which is on the landmark case of the heirs versus the heirs of Henry Turner, Henry Turner, there it is, versus the United States. So I'm the family of those who won that case, all right? So this these pictures in which that we have here came by way of the said scholarship of Ali Muhammad Bey. He had it in his book in which that he states that this is a picture of Eliza Turner Quitman, and this is John A. Drew Quitman, all right? Um, I can't verify this huh. picture here too. Everybody angry right. these days, huh? huh? I can't verify this picture. Who's that? Oh. Uh. He said, "Don't fuck him." <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, so this picture here to the right can't be verified. John A. Drew Quitman. Right. This is possibly the picture of Eliza Turner. So, this is why this portion was called the Real Royal House of Turnica, Turner. Of course, it shows and proves these were the first clues that was given to me that was part of the family line because of all of the Turners that was in my family. Like, okay, this, like, this pages after pages and pages of Turners, what's going on? That was the first clue. So it says, should an individual not achieve their divine destiny in a lifetime, they are reincarnated on this earth to get another opportunity to do so. In this sense, the creator in African traditions is very just. The individualized spirits are not only given one chance, shall they fail to complete their soul destiny. All right? Ancestors, you are us and we are you. You can communicate with us any time. Now, West science call it genetic memory, the study of the transmission of genetic memories in our DNA across generations. Now, keep this in mind. The Gnostic Christ states in the Dead Sea Scroll, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So I had no choice but to bring this information forth once I found out. So here, when asked about Prophet Nobu Ali, be asked about Henry Washington or Henry Turner, excuse me, and you seen 
the connection, father-in-law of third great grand uncle, third great grand uncle. So here we have once again a Sarelli Mel Bay. You are the son of Ronald J. Butler, son of Eleanor Elizabeth Morton, daughter of Emily Drew Trent, daughter of Sarah Drew Hobson, daughter of Frederick D. Drew, son of um, Daphne Drew, mother of John J. Washington Drew, all right, and John J. Drew, the father of Noble Drew Ali. And hence, Noble Drew Ali is my first cousin four times removed. This is what is said when you go to the sites, and I'll show you those sites in a minute for those who disbelieve this information, saying that it was cut and paste, because I know how your Negro minds, minds work. So, you know, um, not those in the class, but, you know, the Negro mind. I, I know their mind. All right, so um, four time removes, if you don't know what that means, remove means different generation. When cousins are in different generations than each other, we say they're removed. Remove is like grand or great, but with cousins. All right, once removed means a difference of one generation, twice removed means a distance, a difference of two generations, and so forth. And if first cousins um, have a child, then child is the first cousin once removed. Okay? So my first cousin's grandchildren are my first cousins twice removed? Right. Right, exactly. Exactly. Here it is right here. Here's the list. Your um, grandparents... All right, your grandparents right here, one cousin. Uh, let me get it. Okay, there it is right here. Yep, grandparents would be your great grandparents would be one cousin once removed. Your second, um, great second grandparents would be first cousin two times removed. Your third great grandparents would be first cousin three times removed. And in my case with Prophet Nobu Ali is my great fourth grandparents, first cousin four times removed. Okay. So, yeah. Um, if your grandparents have your mother, um, brothers and sisters, then all of them born would be your first cousins. If your grandma, your um, your great grandmother, had um, brothers and sisters, and of course they had um, your grandparents, then all of those great grandparents' children, which would be your grandparents' um, brothers and sisters, that would be um, your first cousin one time uh, removed. Your great grandparents' um, brothers and sisters would be your first cousins one time removed. Your um, great second grandparents would be your first cousins two times removed. Okay? That's how that works. First cousin four times removed or separated by six generations. Here's a breakdown of the generations. First generation consists of siblings who are first cousins. Second generations include their children who are first cousins once removed. Third generation includes the grandchildren who are first cousins twice removed. Fourth generation includes the great grandchildren who are first cousins three times removed. Um, the first um, grand um, generation, fifth generation include the great great grandchildren who are first cousins four times removed. All right, that's me and Prophet Nobu Ali. And the sixth generation includes the great 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 grandchildren who were the first cousins five times removed. All right, so there are six generations separating first cousins four times removed, okay? So 
the signs of reincarnation in Africa, he says the belief in some sort of rebirth or reincarnation was common in traditional African societies and still is found today despite the influence of Christianity and Islam on the region. African reincarnation belief typically are associated with signs such as parent dreams, a child's birthmark, and other phenomena. Listen to this term birthmark. Included past life memories. This article focuses on the relationship between belief and signs of reincarnation in sub-Saharan Africa and shows that African reincarnation cases are very similar to cases reported from other parts of the world. Of course they would be, since we are the first on the planet. So here we do this Shadrach, um, Kip, Corey, and Taurus. Um, this is from out of Kenya. All right. It says Kalenji, um, or a paternal um, patrilineal people of Kenya, whose traditional reincarnation beliefs have largely been display, displaced by Christianity. Like other unilineal tribal people, the Kalenji um, expect reincarnation to occur in the lineage. All children are thought to be the, re, the returns of patrilineal ancestors who died 40 days or more days before. When a child is born, the elders assemble for a ritual at which they call out the names of the patrilineal ancestors who have not yet been recognized as having reincarnated. Upon hearing its former name, the child is expected to sneeze or pee, acknowledging it, it as his. In other words, his name, his former name. All right? Says, all right, this is just an example of what happened here. Right here, it says, at his birth on March 21st, 1993, Shadrach, Shad, Taurus, um, sneezed at Bowman, the name of his patrilineal grand or paternal grandfather's cousin brother or parallel cousins. He was assigned Bowman as one of his names, although he chose not to use it, choose not, chooses not to use it. Consistent with having been Bowman, Bowen, Bowen, he was noticed to have a birthmark over his left eye. In middle age, Bowen had accidentally fallen from a rock, almost losing his left eye and leaving a permanent scar. His, he died of unrelated causes at 82 on January the 14th, 1993, nine weeks, 63 days, days before Shad was born. Shad's paternal grandmother, who passed in 2011, used to call him brother-in-law in recognition of his past life as Bowen. When he was 21, Shad visited Bowen's village for the first time. He was recognized as the reincarnation of Bowen by one of Bowen's sons who hugged him on meeting him, although he did not know at the time that Shad was supposed to be Bowen, came back, come back. Shad looked exactly like his father, he said. As they became better acquainted, Bowen's children told Shad that he resembled his father in his calmness and other facets of his personality, his gestures and his manners of making eye contact when speaking to people um, was the same as Bowen. Shad has never had memories of Bowen, and Bowen's children asked him questions he could not answer. Nevertheless, they continued to honor him as their father's return. All right. Now, this is the book which I recommend you get. Um, there's some things, discrepancies of which that I have in it, but um, here, The Princess and the Prophet, The Secret History of Magic Race and the Moorish Muslims in America by Jacob S. Dorman. All right. A Jew, but nevertheless, Jewish, I should say. Um, the same mold is clearly visible. This is what he says in the book. The same mode is clearly visible in other photographs of Noble Dr. Ali from the late date of the late 1920s, such as this one from the collection of the Schomburg Center of the New York um, Public Library. You see the mole on the on the right side of the nose. Here's the mole again. Here he makes mention of this mole. The photo What's of Noble Dr. Ali, Jacob Dorman, D O R. D-O-R-M-A-N, dormant. Okay, I got you. 
All right. All right. So this is a picture of Nobu Ali and who he claims is Nobu Ali is Walter um, Blister, which we disagree with this. Okay. Okay. Notice, notice the prominent mole on the right side of the noses. Okay. Well, yeah, I got one too on the right side of my nose. <laughs> now, all right, all right, all right. So it says your ancestors are you. To listen to them, go within, increase your awareness, and listen to your intuition. So now. I've just proved that Prophet Nobdrali is my first cousin four times removed. I also have a mole on the right side of my nose as well. I'm not saying that I'm Prophet Nobdrali, but I am genetic memory. Right? This is what we're talking about, genetic memory. All right? This is what the European refers to it as. I don't necessarily refer to it as reincarnation per se. But I think it's no coincidence that we have these moles on the right side of our noses. <laughs> and we come from the same family line. So here, a birthmark is a skin marking that is present at birth. Birthmark includes, as we see here, um, cafe or let, or let, spots, whatever that is, and moles, and Mongolian spots. Birthmarks can be red or other colors. All right. So the Native Americans believed in reincarnation. It says, do Native Americans believe in reincarnation? And is resounding yes. There are simply so um, simply not enough thorough and distinct anthropological studies of many tribes belief about this topic. What we do have, however, or first-hand stories from Native Americans as well as research from the few experts in these fields, all right? Thus, this article is merely a snapshot of some of the tribes and their views on this thought-provoking topic. So get the book, Reincarnation's Beliefs of North American Indians by Warren Jefferson, by Warren Jefferson. They believe the exact same thing, all right? So here it says uh, reincarnation through bloodlines. It says some sources also speak of the dead being born in one of their descendants, although never in the, someone outside of their family line. Here as well, the sources are unclear as to how exactly this would happen. But oftentimes the dead person is reincarnated in someone who is named after him or her. Reincarnation and honoring the ancestors, all right? This is a very good article. Make sure you look this article up, Reincarnation and Honoring Ancestors, okay? Oh, so, that's not a book? Yeah, that's a book. That's an article. You can look that article up on Google it on um, YouTube, not YouTube, but... um. Google. Okay. Or Bing, or Bing, or one of those other platforms. Okay. Um, the Igbo, the Igbo says birthmarks. It says among the Igbo, birthmarks are said to correspond to the previous incarnation of the newborns, and as one of the means used to identify the reincarnated ancestors before naming the child. All right. This is according to ancestral voices. Since I didn't know. Who my ancestors were, I couldn't have been given that opportunity. I was never given that opportunity. So we go here. The official Washington, Washington Royal Imperial Bloodline. Since we figured out um, the Imperial Bloodline, all right, of Nobudra Ali, we also show that. The Empress is Nobudra Ali's nephew and niece. All right. All right. Here, 
nephew and nieces you have here, remember, Corella, his sister, had John Gaston. So that is Prophet Nubadra Ali's nephew. Okay? His niece would be Verdiasi, Washington, the Empress, by marriage. Okay. So here's a picture of the Empress. A picture of Wendy and Joe. Empress Vidyasi Tierra Washington Turner Gaston L. Bay, May 4th, 1927, and April 19th, 2014. She passed on my born day, y'all. So it was like she was saying, check him out. He's trying to follow in the footsteps of the ancestors. And I am, truthfully. I have no choice. I get spanked if I don't. And I'm serious about that. Dang, that's so my right birthday, here. March 19th. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you and I both. Yeah. He said his birthday is March 19th. And you're still within that's that cuss of Pi being a Pisces and an Aries. Right. Yep. 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 The last day. Yeah. That's me. March mm -hmm. 28. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So right here, in fact, this is what happened. My wife and I was out with a friend, and he was performing at this um, blues and jazz club. All right? And Lisa, who was over... Um, Around products to be recalled. Over the Empire, well, I want to say she was, she was like the staff. She was like the head staff person over the um over the Empire Washington. She called us to let us know that the Empress passed. Many were storage and shipping warehouses, including Amazon facilities, not the product maker itself. So I don't know either. Oftentimes, if it ends up being overseen, it's all right. So, Lisa called us that night, and she was with Joe. Oh, um. Um, at the time with the Empire Washington, and she told us that Empress passed. So she gave us um the information. We gave our condolences um to to um the Empire Washington to Joe the family. Um, and this was April the twenty four um April nineteenth, twenty fourteen. All right, nearly ten years ago. All right. Um, so at that time, they was upset with us because we was following the blueprint in which that was laid for us by Crown Prince Hutan Tupac Bey, formerly Prince Ramses Abel Bey. And Joe had a problem with us riding on our own plates, um, as well as doing some of the um, nationalizing and so forth and so on, and he didn't want us to do so. But yet his mother did so, and we told his mother that we was going to do so, and she told us the plan. She said, follow the plan in the book. In other words, her book. She, as a matter of fact, that's the first question she asked us. Did y'all read my book? And we said, yes, ma'am, we've read it. We have copies of it here. And he said, good. That's what she said. She said, good. Said that's what y'all need. 
Now, this is right after she asked all of our names. She wanted to get all of our names. And when she kept and when she got to my wife now, she heard the name L Bay. She said, Where y'all get that from? <laughs> and um and um now we know where we got it from. And um Joe said, Mama, you know they got it after you. And we all started laughing. <laughs> so she knew that we was gonna follow the plan. Okay. Knowingly or not knowing that we was cousins or that we was related, that we was in the same family. Knowingly or not knowingly. And the ancestors always have ways of tying things together, as I notice. I give another prime example. My wife's family is from here in Warren County, um, Vance County, Warren County, Granville County area, which is this area here that we're located at. Well, I had a cousin who told me, he said, well, you know that um, our family is, is um, specifically from North Carolina. I said, from North Carolina? I said, and I'm like, well, what section? And she said, Warren County, the same exact location as my wife people location. Now, did we know this 20 years ago? No. Didn't know this 20 years ago. When her, when, um, well, shoot, it's shoot, it 25 years ago now when her and I met in 1998. 20 years ago when we got married, 2003. Did we know this? We didn't know this. We just found out in 2021. The ancestors have a way of bringing you back to where you need to be. I would never thought of being in Warrington, uh, uh, in Warren County, in Warrington, or uh, or uh, or in Henderson, Vance County. I would never thought that. My wife wouldn't have thought it either. Shoot, we was both in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. This is amazing how life leads us back, how the ancestors lead us back to them. I give another example. We was at Brother Panic's Pan Portal celebration last weekend. I had a fantastic time. I might have seen a little clip of the video where me and Queen is dancing. I asked us off. She danced basically the whole time, and I was. Basically, right there, what I, I sat down on a couple of them because I couldn't get with the um, DJ and his music skills. But that's another story. But um, <laughs> but anyway, um, Bob, y'all might know who Bob is. Um, world renowned rapper, um, from out of Atlanta, Georgia. He was there. Um. We known Bob now for shoot about shit seven years, eight years, yeah maybe yeah about eight years now, seven eight years. Well, we also knew his cousin, his first cousin. All right, his first cousin knew Khadijah's sister. They went to school with each other. Elementary school. They knew each other ever since they was like in the I think early grades. Now Khadija, if you don't know, is Panic's wife. Watch Taish. Yeah, I tell you what is. So the county that y'all in, right? Mm -hmm. My my grandparents was from North Carolina as well. They was from mm -hmm. King King Street, North Carolina. Is that anywhere near the county y'all in? What's the, what's the county? King Street, North Carolina. Kingston or King Street? What's the, King Street? King Tree or King Street, something like that. King Tree. Hold on, I'm gonna. I have, to, I have to look that up, guys. That is. Yeah. 
You sure that's not South Carolina? Queen said that might be South Carolina. Is that South Carolina? It might be South Carolina. You, I thought they said well, I, Tree, North Carolina. I thought yeah, they said King. That's okay, South Carolina? Queen said, yeah, Queen said that's South Carolina. King's Tree. That's what it's called. King's, K-I-N-G-S, Tree. All right, because you, know, you, you know the rapper Trick Daddy. Right. I found out he and I are cousins. Oh, I see. And he, he, he told me our family history was uh, wow. Gullah Geechee and, and Cherokee. Well, he, he confirmed the Cherokee side. I already knew that because my my father's mother was straight off the reservation. Right. And when I did my family research like you did Jules, uh, there's no birth record. There's no records of my grandmother other than being married to my grandfather. Right. They don't have no, she's not on no other registries other than marrying him. Right. And so, see, that's deep because, once again, we're looking at, um, when I was reading, I just went over the birth certificates, but they also had the marriage certificate when those um, when the states um, instituted those, as well as also the death certificates. I didn't get to that information. Um, class was already long as it was, but um, I just wanted to go over that information and show how the ancestors always bring us back to them. You just have to look at the signs and symbols. You just have to pay attention and be aware and conscious of what is taking place. And once again, the most important aspect is to know thyself. And if you're not willing to want to dig and dive into uh, the deep waters of, of your heritage, then I don't know what's the point of you even existing on planet Earth, you know, because you don't want to know, you know, these bloodlines, these lineages of which that makes you up, and you scared that the crack is going to damn know something that you don't know. He already know who you are. If you are somebody who's special, and you're damn, and you have a light about yourself, he already know. And the devil can't touch you unless God allow it. That's the same shit that you've seen with the signs of Job. Job couldn't be killed only if God allowed it. But God allowed certain things to happen to Job because he didn't want to pay attention. Okay. And as I was saying about um, um, first cousin to brother um, B.O.B. Bob, Bobby Ray, he um, he knew Khadijah's sister. They went to school together, you know, in Colorado. He just moved back. He just moved to Atlanta, Georgia two months ago. And this was based on what happened with Brother Panic. And he met Khadijah's sister and was like, what you doing here? And, and she was like, what you doing here? And then they realized, hold up, you Khadijah's sister? They was already part of the family the whole time. B.O.B., his first cousin, Khadijah, and, his, and her sister. Along with Brother Panic, it was it was already a family affair, all the way from Colorado to Atlanta, Georgia. How is that possible? Because the ancestors are always trying to lead you back to them. All right, y'all. That's the end of class for today. Any questions concerning anything that we're going over? Uh yeah, you said you recorded it. How do we get the recording of this class? Um, just put forth a donation. Once I download it, I can send it to you. Okay, thank you. All right. Great class, Doc. Because you got people out here trying to tell us not to do our genealogy and speak against um honoring your ancestors. So. Right. But if the ancestors they're going to help get your ass up out of this mess, and that's why I've showed this, because I had people tell me for the last 20 years, well, brother, why would you represent something that you ain't even a family member of? 
Hmm. Well, guess what? Now they can't say that shit, can they? They can't say that I'm not related to Prophet Nobudra Ali, my first cousin. They can't say that I'm not related to the Empress, my first cousin by marriage. They can't say that I'm not related to um, Henry um, Joseph uh, uh, um, Turner. Can they? No, they can't say I'm not related to any of these people because I showed you specifically that I am. And to prove it, once again, let's go. Closing argument. Got a few more seconds here. Boom. Okay, so here we go to Ancestry. Can everybody see this page? Yeah, bro. All right. So family history, Osorio Lima Bay, family tree, boom. All right, so you go straight into the family tree. This is me right here, as you can see. You got a problem with it, there it is. Let's blow it up. This is for the naysayers, right? This is my father. This is my mother. This is my father's father. This is my father's mother. And we're going to follow the mother's side right now. Her mother. Bam. Bam. And her mother, Sarah Drew. Sarah Drew is the daughter of Frederick D. Drew and Matilda Hobson Sims, as you see here. Now, Frederick Drew, as you see here, his brother too, John Washington Drew. Who's married to who? Eliza Turner. Son is Prophet Nobudra Ali, the fifth royal regent, Marquis de Maison Rouge estate. Sister, Corella Drew Gaston. to John Louis Gaston, the sixth royal regent, Marquise de Maison Rouge, who married the Empress, Verdiasi, Turnica Washington, Gaston Albay, Empress of the Empire Washington. This is me. Hence, as you see here, my first cousin, one time removed, Wendy Washington, the current empress. As you see here, Frederick Joe Joseph Washington, my first cousin, two times removed. And as you see here, the empress. My first cousin, three times removed, in law. Now, 
I got another chart glitch in which that um I do my mother's side of the family and Prince Bay is part of the Clark family on that side of the family and related to that side of the family. So, that means that if Joe's the, if um, John Lewis Gaston is the sixth royal regent, Joe, who calls himself King Joe, who is King Joe, would be the seventh. And being that I am a first cousin and of them, then I too would be over as the royal regent, crown prince, royal regent of the Maison de Rouge. And this is the lineage, y'all. This is the royal family of the Americas. We also have the royal family of Europe, as well as the royal family of Africa. Uh, okay, what, and I'll get what, what, um, what resource can you use for tracing your lineage? If you know, like for me, my dad is from Nigeria. Um, you know, for like African ancestry, if they have, you know. Yeah, the the best thing you can do is my true ancestry for mm -hmm. that. Okay. You got to get get a, get a <clears throat> upload your information to my true ancestry, and then they will show you the African connections of your father. Okay. And I'll show that. everybody that. Yeah, I'm gonna mm -hmm. show everybody that um the next class um how the royal bloodlines of Europe and the royal bloodlines of Africa all intermingled into the royal bloodlines of America. Mm. Yeah, the, she did a class on that about a year ago. And right. like connecting, like just connecting the dots. Right. But now I'm mm. going more specifically because now I'll be using the names of the individuals. I did an overall general oh. class on it. When I realized that I had to be, I had to be related to the emperors because I had the Washington and the Turners in the family. But now to know that they're my first cousins, once, two, three, four times removed, then that sets everything into a different understanding because that means that we had the exact same great great grandfathers and great great grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that means you had the blood. Yeah, the right. blood. So, so let me ask you this, Dr. Ali. No disrespect yes. to, uh, to Joe or whatever, but I know that he was adopted. So, would by blood would that make you, um, what should I say, like uh, uh, more of an heir than he is? It could, but I'm not. You know, I'm not trying to go there. But we do see that Prophet Nodrali is the fifth Marquise of Maison Rouge. His sister's son is the sixth Marquise of Maison Rouge. You know? So, yeah, that would put me in position as the seventh or the eighth um, of the Maison Rouge because this is my actual biological, not by adoption. Exactly. I'm not being disrespectful or anything, too, but maybe that's why you're more in tune to the information that he is, because he didn't himself believe his mom, which was the empress. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's true. That's very true, God. And I had no choice but to believe, and then for her to come to me, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, as well as to be led back to this, you know, 50 years later. I mean, come on. That means they were always trying to drive me here, always bring me back to here, you know. But I couldn't because I didn't have the information. I didn't. There was no unsealed records.
for the birth certificate at that time. There was no, um, even private investigators, which I had private investigators on this information, they couldn't find me anything until I did the DNA test. Right. When I did the DNA test, like I showed y'all, the first person came up was my mother's sister. Then I found my mother. Then my uh, mother's sister, my aunt, sent me a picture of my father. Then I was able to find my sister on Facebook, my half-sister on Facebook, through my father. Now I got a full biological sister also through my father and my um, mother. Her name is Tracy. But the crazy thing is that my sister name is Halima. Just like I am Aileen, her name is Alima. <laughs> now, what kind of coincidence shit is that? I can't make this up. So that means that my dad knew about this information. He was on this information. For him to call the name my um my um sister Halima H A L I M A and I'm A L I M and I had that name since eighty eight. Not knowing that my sister had the same name. <laughs> How would I have known that? When it was my girlfriend at the time who picked my name after I picked it. I already had my name decided. And she said, well, let me hold the Islamic name book that you, you know, that you've been reading. I didn't tell her the name. She said, I can help you, you know, find your name. And she came back the next day with the exact same name that I chose for myself. And that's how I knew that was my name. And then to come to find out that my sister has the same name. Halima Butler. <laughs> I can't make this shit up. This is the ancestors always leading you back to yourself, back to them. If you listen. I had to listen. After the Empress came to me and said, you're not doing enough? Shit, I put my head down even in the dream. <laughs> but now I know what she was talking about. I wasn't doing enough research and finding the ties of the family. And that I was part of the family. After 20 years of being told, why would you, why are you going to put something and you're not even a family member? And I could put this in their face and say, oh, I'm not a family member. Oh, let's look at these um, ancestral ties. What's your lineage? What's your heritage? I know mine now. I know Prophet Nudrali is my first cousin four times removed. And Corella, his sister, is my first cousin four times removed. Their son John Gaston, who's the six small keys of Mason Rouge, is my third is my first cousin three times removed. His wife, the Empress, where do you see Gaston L. Bay? First cousin three times removed by marriage. And then that's not even talking about the fact that um, I didn't even get to the Turner um, in Washington side of the um, of the family as well, because I'm also related on the Washington or Turnica, um, Turnica or Turner side of the family as well, because I showed you all the Washington and the Turner family. So I'm also related um, to the Empress on another side of the family, which I hasn't even which I haven't even gone into yet. And then Joe. And um, is my first cousin two times removed. Wendy is my first cousin once removed. (laughs) 
truth is stranger than fiction. Now there's no more argument about who is who. All right, y'all. Um, I'm say peace to everyone. Yeah, I'll tell you what's to each. What's to each? Yeah, I'll tell you what's to each. Appreciate y'all listening. Thank you. Hi. Greetings, peace. Sorry, I'm just in a bit of um, a bit of pain today, so I'm a bit quiet. Okay, here you got us. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. So we're yeah. getting to the Qigong. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting to the Qigong breathing exercises, Dantian breathing. The key to using Dantian breathing is to help heal yourself. It inhales gently all the way down to your Dantian area, about an inch or two below your navel. As you inhale, put your attention on the lower Dantian and sense your breath energy filling in your lower abdomen. Feel how your abdomen naturally expands. If you like, you can place your hands there on your belly, called belly breathing exercise, to help attract your breath there. As you exhale, sense any tension and toxins going out the breath as your abdominal or abdomen naturally contracts. Learn to be attentive to the vital warmth or vibration of the breath energy remaining in your abdomen as you exhale. Guard it with your awareness. Feel it being absorbed deeply into your cells as you exhale waste product upward and out through your nose or mouth. Do not use any force or effort in doing this practice. Use only your awareness and your attention. So, Let's do this. You can place your hands at your abdomen or your belly button and breathe about an inch below your belly button and visualize a golden light like a sun growing into or growing in that area. Let's begin.
Okay. Yeah. You should have felt a warm sensation, energy within your dantian, which is about an inch or so below your navel. Yeah, I feel a bit lightheaded as well. <laughs> That's how it feels when you go into different dimensions of yourself. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the next breath is the stimulating breath, also called the bellow breathing or bellow breath. This stimulating breath is adapted from a yogi breathing technique. It is aimed at raising vital energy, increasing alertness. So we just did the Dantian breathing, which relaxes. us. Now we're going to revitalize us. Inhale and exhale rapidly through your nose, keeping your mouth closed, but relax. Your breath, your breath, your breaths is in and out and should be equal in duration, but as short as possible. So. This is a noisy breathing exercise. Try for, ten, for three in and out breath cycles per second. To produce a quick movement in the diaphragm, Suggesting the bellows. Breathe normally about each cycle. Do not do for more than 15 seconds on your first try. Each time you practice this stimulating breath, you should increase your time by five seconds or so until you reach a full minute. So we can practice this. Okay. Yeah. The next breath is the four, seven, eight breath. So you're going to inhale through your mouth, making a whoosh noise or sound. Close your mouth and inhale gently through the nose to a mental count of four. Hold your breath for a count of seven, and then um, complete. Exhale completely through your mouth, making a whoosh noise. Um, to a count of eight, so. This is one breath. Now inhale again and repeat the cycle three more times for a total of four breaths. So we're gonna do this. Inhale for four, hold it for seven, exhale for eight with a whoosh noise. Let's begin.
Okay. I'm finished now. Okay. So right, the next breath is called the alternating nostril breath technique or anuma viloma in which that you're going to do the ratio of two, eight, four. So you're going to breathe in for two, hold it for eight, breathe out for four. The left nostril is the path to the nida, a nadi called ida, and the right nostril is the path to the nadi called pingala. All right? So... Okay. Now, no more viloma revitalizes, equalizes, balances the flow of prana in the body. One round of onoma viloma makes up six steps, as shown. Um, start by practicing the three rounds and build up slowly to the 20 rounds. Are we doing this now? Or are you still reading? Yeah, we're going to get ready to do this. We're going to do three rounds. So we're just going to do um, three rounds. And you can slowly build up to 20 rounds, but we're just going to do three rounds for right now. So, um, no, no, I'm in. Uh, peace, God. Peace, God. Um, and we're going to do two, eight, four. So breathe in for two, hold it for eight, breathe out for four. Um, we're going to. Once we do the four, um, three rounds, excuse me, once we do the three rounds, we're going to do four, sixteen, eight. Okay. All right, so let's begin. Okay, let's go to the four sixteen eight. Four sixteen eight. Okay. Breathe in for a count of four, hold it for sixteen, breathe out for eight. Yeah. 
Okay, now with the alternating nostril breath technique, what it does is lower your blood pressure. It balances both hemispheres of the brain. It synergizes the brain, unify the mind, bring you one back in balance. And balances the left and right hemisphere, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I've just written that down. <laughs> mm-hmm. I can't. I can't hear you. We're in and out. No, I said you still there. I've just finished writing what you're saying now. Okay. So this is considered by the yogis to be the best technique to calm the mind and the nervous system. Okay.
Okay, so when we know about the alternating nostril breath technique, and when you do it, uh, whether it's two four, um, we also see the chi power in it, because the cycle of chi is based on the energy in the particular, not just the kundalini, residing in the spine, at the abode, which is at the When we look at the meridians, the important part is that there's seven, um, well, six meridians on the right side, six meridians on the left side, and they're attached to what is called the two um, vessels, the conceptional vessel and what is known as the governing vessel, which is the conceptional vessel goes up, um, the governing vessel goes up from the perineum up the spinal column, up the top of the braid, I mean brain, and then the concept the um, conceptual vessel comes down the front of the body, center line of the body, along the chakra points, back to the meridian. Okay. All right, as we see here, the meridians should be cleared by using that breath technique, whether the stimulating breath technique or the 478 breath technique, which is basically for um, calming the nerves, calming the body, the brain, removing stress. It can be done for the lungs between 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. If you're waking up around that time period, then that should be what is done. Okay. Lord and chest between 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., stomach between 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., spleen between 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., me a.m., heart between 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., small intestine between 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., urinary bladder 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., kidneys 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., cardio 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., water between 9 a.m. 11 p.m., gallbladder between 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., liver between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., So the chi begins to flow in the lungs, then travels to the small and large intestines. From there, it goes into the stomach, then to the spleen, then travels to the heart, then to the small intestines. First, it goes to the urinary. So Yep. I'm just looking at the various times and during those time periods, like I said, if you're waking up or if you have pain um in any of these areas, the best time to do the breathing exercises 
to remove the toxins and the poisons would be during these time periods. So when you were looking at the liver between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning, Yeah, that's what I do, guy. When I wake up at um, late at night, I do your breathing exercises and go to sleep and have good, good dreams. <laughs> right. Okay. So as you see here, you have the Qigong navel spleen area. Then you have the Qigong, uh, which is the solar plexus, the pancreas. All right. That's at the solar plexus area. And then at the navel is the Qigong. Um, navel spleen area. Now you store this energy as we just finished showing you. Take your hands, place them over your navel, and then breathe down into your dantian, about an inch or so below your navel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Huh? You say, Goddess, I can't hear you. I said using the gold light again. Yes, the sun, you have the gold light. And break it down into your dantian, and then what we're going to do is circulate that energy for the males up the spine to the top of the head, and then when you reach the top of the head, then you want to <clears throat> Exhale as you breathe back down to the Dantian. All right, in this particular, you'll go all the way down to what is known as the perineum, which is called the Yu Yin. Perineum, which is the gate of death and life, is the Yu Yin. This is why you lock that area as you're breathing up, inhaling. So once you accumulate the energy in the Qigong um, area, then is able to is ready to be moved to the Hu Yin. Inhale. Exhale. And you make a full rota rotation back down to the perineum. So you take the energy up, and then exhale the energy down back to the perennial, to Hu Yin, and circulate the energy nine times in that manner. And then on the last rotation, you'll bring the energy up, inhale, and then as you exhale, energy down, but you're going to send it back now to the lower dantian, back to an inch below the navel chakra. Let's begin.
Say it again. Now when you are finished off. Okay. So now that you have circulated the energy back to the lower than ten, what we want to do now is take your hands. You as a woman would take your right hand, place over your left hand on top of your navel chakra. So your left hand would be on top, your right um on top of your navel, and then your right hand would be on top of that. Yeah. And vice versa for the male. Your right hand would go over the belly button and your left hand would be on top. Okay. Now what you want to do is rotate your hands in a circular motion around your navel in the lower dantian area 36 times. All right, 36 times to the left, and then 24 times to the right. Let's begin. How many times to the left, sorry? Four. Four. Twenty And then once you finish, just leave your hand over your navel, dantian area, for about three minutes. Okay. Yes. No, no. We in class, bro. Are you coming? I'm sorry. I just realized we was having class. I'm like, yo. Okay, so we'll see you in a minute, all right? All right, so. Peace. So what happened is that the energy was that you accumulated, you are now 
settle the energy into your lower dantian, into your major vital organs, and which that helps to give the organs the ability in order to have more life. Okay. This is also called the um the teachings of the eight immortals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, once you remove your hands, you go feel the energy there in your lower dantian accumulated. You can do that a few times out the day in order to recharge your system. You know, on the hand rotation, are the hands meant to be rotating outwards or inwards? Mm -hmm. It's meant to be outwards or does it matter? You said, is it meant to be outwards? No, it's just around the belly button area. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Now we're going to do this, looking at the sun to expel toxins. You can see the sun in your mind's eye. You can do this at the sunrise or sunset. You can sit with your hands on top of your knees or cross and cross legged. Lean your head back slightly. Inhale through the nose and envision the sun's energy entering the body, circulating down the front of the spine, wrapping around the front of the body via the tip of the spine. Mentu Ra. Greetings, peace. Yes, I'm here. All right, exhale and envision the energy moving up the front of the body and spewing out the mouth in a form of filthy black smoke. You can do this, repeat this 12 times. You're just going to do 12 times, 12, 24 times.
The only way I can describe it, it's like um, an inner hug. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Um, I also had the vision of the light going through my um, the face. And the business, so I'll go through the left, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. 
ready now. I just need to go to the toilet for a minute. <laughs> it won't be a minute. Okay, we're going to go to benefit for the liver and the spleen. Your liver is on the right side of your body. The spleen is on the left side of the body underneath the stomach area. Your liver plays 500 functions in the body. So what we're going to do is breathe in, hold it. Sorry, I'm back now. You okay. Oh, it's cold. It's bees at the moment. It's just... <laughs> right, I'm ready now. Okay, so we're going to do the liver, follow the instructions. Drop your head back gently, then bring your head forward, expelling the noise through the nostrils in a strong manner. Do this 10 to 15 times. If you need to, read it again and perform the exercise. Okay, what this does is cleanse the liver from toxins and poisons. Next benefit is for the heart. You breathe in through, take a deep breath through your left nostril, close both nostrils, hold your breath as long as it's comfortable. Let the breath out through one half of the right nostril slowly. This is highly concentrated, therefore it's done one to three times only.
Okay. Yeah. All right, the next one is the thyroid gland, parathyroid gland. Same as the heart, except now we're going to alternate back and forth between the nostrils. Okay, let's do the next one, which is the the lungs. Just get rid of stale air. Close the right nostril with the right thumb. Take a full breath in through the left nostril. Close both nostrils, expelling out through the mouth with the ha sound. Alternate back and forth 10 to 15 times. Let's begin. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Okay, here's another one in which that this increases your healing energy. So you can read one through five. Take a deep breath to count of five. You will hold it for a count of ten. So you would breathe in for five. Yeah. And then breathe out for a count of ten. Consecutively, you're going to do this ten times. And you want your jaws firm. You want to clench each hand into a fist. You want your tongue up at the top palate of your mouth. Uh, when it says sit erect, is it talking about your your back? Yes. Okay. So let's begin. Okay.
Where do you know when you are? Say that again. I said I'm ready now when you are. God, on this exercise, we were breathing out through our, nose, our nostrils, correct? Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. Right, this is a demonstration of the Dantian breathing. All right, so look here and read the deep abdominal breathing, then TM breathing. This is another version, but I like this one. We're going to do this one 12 times. Breathe in and out through your nose. Inhale, look, visualize a golden ball of energy like a small sun growing in your lower dantian. And as you exhale, visualize the golden ball intensifying its glow. With each breath, see the light growing brighter and brighter. 12 times instead of 36, inhales and exhales. Practice for at least three to five minutes. 10 minutes is ideal throughout the day. Take one deep, uh, two dantian breathing exercises to recharge your internal system. All right, let's do this. Okay, we're going to end class here. Are there any questions on the breath techniques taught tonight? No, God, very good information tonight. All right, well, I'll send out this to you. Um, email me and I can send it out to everyone. Um, and practice, 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 practice. All right? Yes, God, appreciate that. I will be emailing you. All right, thank you. Peace. Peace, everybody. specific time, because we don't do all of them at once. Um... No, you can do as you feel. You don't have to do everything at one time. I follow you in Twitter basically. Where? Yeah, I was saying you don't have to do all of it at one time. You can do what feels good for you um, throughout the day. Okay. Just to okay. get but practice. That's the main thing. Yeah. Also, God, 
uh, is class at seven or six thirty on Sunday? No, it, um, it, it, it it was supposed to be at six, but I went over. But I'm glad that y'all stuck in there with me, and so yeah. Okay, I'll just be more sharp next time. Appreciate it, God bless. Bless, peace. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Dr. Aline. Yes. I'll see you next week. Peace. Um, I had a question. So I, I missed a few classes. Um, I saw your message about emailing you. Am I emailing the Royal House one? Yes. Okay. I'll reach out. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Peace, we buddy. missed classes, too. We wasn't here last week or the week before that. So it's, it's okay. Okay. Thank you all again, man. Y'all have a good one. All right. You, too. Thank you.